you guys want me cancelled. That's why you're suggesting all these videos that go against the uh, current wisdom of the world. So, um, you know, if we're going to get cancelled, we may as well fucking embrace it, right? So, uh, Balila just made a video. Blizzard, this isn't very Warcraft. Apparently, it has something to do with the Night of Quest lines and it has something to do with, I don't know, politics or some shit. I'm not entirely sure. I guess we'll we'll find out, shall we? Welcome back, everyone. Today, things, in fact, get more interesting than we really bargained. I also really enjoy the fact that since Panda TV have, have called out Balialer, it seems like Balialer is just on a tear making negative video after negative video about World of Warcraft. <laughs> and I say negative videos because they're not negative videos. Whenever you watch a Balialer video, it's usually just proper feedback that's given, but the positive crowd will absolutely view anything that you say about World of Warcraft that isn't 100% just sucking Ian's dick as negative feedback. For. So, you know the way that people have been complaining about the treatment of Night Elves in World of Warcraft for years now? They're yep. one of WoW's most unique, beloved races, and they've continually been given the short straw. We had made It's not just that Night Elves have been given the short straw, it's that the literal guy on your screen uh, have basically been forgotten for so many fucking years. There's been so many storylines where Malfurion would have absolutely been able to shine if you go, for example, back to Val Shirah, and you look at that storyline. They turned Malfurion into a little bitch. Malfurion, like, do you have any idea how many people, after the storyline of Val Shirah, thinks that Malfurion is just a weak fucking asshole that doesn't know what he's doing? When in reality, he may actually be one of the strongest characters in World of Warcraft, lore-wise, he may actually be one of the strongest characters. And yet, they turned him into an absolute little bitch that, that can't stand up for himself and just crying for Tyrande to save him. It, it's, it's beyond idiotic. Major characters sidelined or used as punchlines for other characters' development. They've been hit with senseless tragedy one after yep. the other. There are broken and battered people who have been frozen in time at their lowest point in spite of being the goddamn cover image for World of Warcraft. They're also the second most played race in Europe and North America behind the Night Elves, making them hmm. the most popular alliance race in the game. They're wow. also maybe the most important race in the game from a narrative perspective with their ties to the planet and a loon. So, I think we all hoped that the Heritage Quest... I mean, to be fair, you want to talk about... You want to talk about a race that have more story than any other race in World of Warcraft, it is the Night Elves. People might be forgiven for saying, well, trolls, because trolls were first. But actually, no, because much of the early days of trolls were absolutely just running around doing fuck all. They were just savages. They were literally just fighting over food and sort of fighting over land. There, there was very little in terms of... Um, civilization in terms of like m massive narrative stuff for trolls it wasn't until much later that trolls really started to get a proper story and a proper civilization and, and sort of building on top of that whereas the night elves they were the the first race that, like, that really formed civilization that formed stories and a lot of the stories happened around the night elves would finally put some of that respect in but it didn't. Course. The Heritage Quest itself wasn't bad, but it does highlight a problem that plagues WoW to its very heart. One that will slowly drive a huge portion, and has been driving a huge portion of the lore-focused players Welcome. away. Yet, somehow, it also has the exact energy, the exact uh, type of content, that could literally save WoW from the malaise that hangs over it from Dragonflight. Okay, that seems crazy, so let me explain. The quest opens with you being summoned to Warden Arconarin Starshade. It's quite a long name in Stormwind. <laughs> Massive name. All players will, of course, recognize her actually as a night elf that you rescue from Jadenar in Felwood all the way back in Classic. But you will not recognize her brother, Lysander, because he was only a baby back then. In the time since her escape, she has become a warden and her brother grew up as a mage. 
This quest has all the markings of a developer's love and care put in, because you get to chat with these characters about things. Uh, Nari's carrying the sword of her human paladin mate, Trey, who was tortured and killed in that quest chain back in Classic. Lysander uh -huh. is Damn. talking about being born after the battle for Hygel, meaning he's like, what, 19 years old at most? He's part of a new generation that's never experienced immortality or any of those old night elf things. So you're tasked to meet Maiev in Felwood to investigate Jadenor. There's been a resurgence in demonic corruption, and Taronda has not heard back from the detachment that she sent to sort it out. You find Maiev, mourning a dead priestess of the moon, learning that her mission was to purify the moon well and to begin to reclaim the land. And a cute touch, actually. If you die in the zone during this quest, the priestess is actually there as a spirit healer. Wow. And of course, the idea of Felwood being... Dude, that's not bad. I mean, attention to fucking detail. Well done. Sloan, how you doing, brother? Really well done. Stored for night elves, that is the sort of thing we want to see. The dialogue and the voice work here is... Spoiler alert. I've not done the night elf uh, heritage quest line. Why? Because I'm not an alliance scumbag. I play Horde, and only Horde. So, I have no idea what happened in the Night Elf uh, Heritage Armor. Uh, I, all I know is they didn't all die, so I, I didn't throw a party. I just sort of accepted it, right? Is solid. Maiev's famous growl and rough attitude you, kind of carries. You see, Lysander <laughs> is a mage, and as the leader of the Watchers, one who has spent uh, her day since the Sundering hunting demons, Maiev has absolutely zero trust in him. She'd probably kill him if he wasn't Harry's brother. A little known fact about Maiev from the Wolfheart novel is useful here. She hates mages. She actually hates them yeah. so much, she secretly assassinated a ton of allied highborn mages and even plotted to kill Malfurion for- I feel like a lot of people don't know this lore because Blizzard have sort of forgotten to even give essence or throwbacks to this lore. But yes, for those of you that don't know, it's not just Maev that hates mages. Technically speaking, the distrust in mages run very deep in Night Elf society as a result of what the mages did. Remember, it was because of the mages that the demons came through. It was their, uh, basically, finger-fucking the eternity, the Well of Eternity, that allowed for all of this shit to happen. So, a lot of people in Night Elf society severely distrust uh, mages. For all of his failures as a leader. Oh my god! Yeah, a lot of people- Peter Lee, 24 months, part of the DJ Nation, appreciate ya. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, me, uh, I gotta finish my work here for the weekend fest. Enjoy, DJ. Thank you so much for coming to say hello, at least. Majors uh, change class to warlocks? No. Uh, no, not at all. People don't know that about her. Now, this manifests as her being snarky. Lysander makes observations about magic and fell in the area, and she just bullies him for saying it's obvious. She refuses to use his name. Meanwhile, he goes on to call her Maiev, but he catches himself and says Warden, like his sister. Now, you start to make your way into Jadenar proper, learning on the way that a lot of the satyr you're killing are actually corrupted sentinels. And it's thanks to Lysander's knowledge of the Fowl and Arcane that you can free their spirits from corruption. And over the course of a slow RP walk under Maiev's protection, which was a crazy buggy and frustratingly slow experience on launch day, they keep chatting. It turns out this place, whatever it was called before Jadenar, was where their mother, a druid, slept. And that's okay. another bit of lore that's easy to forget. After the Sundering, when Nordrasil was blessed by the Aspects, Yazara's part came with a price. Malfurion and the new druids would have to help Yazara care for and protect the dream, which meant that they were called to sleep for vast swaths of yeah. time spent in service apart from family and loved ones. And I Still, I, I need to point this out. I, I am yet to understand exactly what the druids and the green dragons actually do inside the Emerald Dream. Now, I know what the official line is and the official line from the Titan's perspective. I understand that perfectly. But their job is to 
safeguard the Emerald Dream. The Emerald Dream has only ever once been under attack, and that was by the Old Gods and the creation of the Nightmare, which, of course, they did not stop. So one would have to ask yourself, what exactly is their job if, quite literally, the only time they have ever been called to do their job, they fucking failed miserably? Because the Emerald Nightmare is very much a place that does exist, and it still exists. They've not been able to purge it, they've not been able to stop it really, they've been able to slow its growth at best. So you do wonder sometimes what it is that they're actually doing in there, and it may be bestiality, but let's hope not. As you get this further is in, Gate 3. Arcanarin reveals the truth to her brother, that this is where, yes, she was captured and held by the demons back in Classic, and that is why she's been acting weird. Maya tells an area of her own capture at Illidan's hands, but that the freedom that comes after is hers alone, and ultimately she chose to join the Wardens, and that was a blessing. Lysander asks Maya if she has any siblings, and she brings up Jared and his various heroic deeds. <laughs> Yo, <Cute bonding moment. laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, they're just gardening. Uh, all right, I stand corrected. You're right. It is hard work. So much so I wouldn't fucking do it in real life. But uh, all right, that makes sense. So they're just watering the plants and mowing the lawn and, you know, making sure that all the flowers grow in, in their own little respective areas. Okay, I can respect that moment because she's clearly not used to somebody knowing of Jared or showing interest in her, and after that she calls Lysander by name. Moving on, the actual questing here is simple. Kill a load of demons and cultists, which includes some pretty new additions like corrupted Magar orcs, which tells a tiny story of what influence demons can still have in the world. The other part is to protect Lysander while he closes portals deep within the Barrow Dance. He has tons of voice dialogue during this. He's seen grief despite his youth, and he even says you, the Night Elf player, has- The problem with that, Saving Raven, is we have no evidence to suggest that it does that, or that they do that, which is why I constantly come back to uh, what, what exactly it is that they do, because the Everbloom grew like became a massive problem because it was life unhindered whereas the dream isn't life unhindered the dream doesn't come from life if the chronicles are to be believed the dream comes from anr or if the chronicles are to be believed the dream comes from anr and elun or if the chronicles is to be believed the dream comes from elun and anr halt or if the Chronicles are to be believed, the dream just fucking existed. And A&R and Elun simply ordered it. Or the Chronicles doesn't know what the fuck it's talking about, because all four of those things are said in the Chronicles as potential ways in which the dream exists in various locations of the Chronicles. So the Chronicles itself doesn't even know what the fuck the dream is or exactly how it exists. Only that it's uh, a thing that is supposed to be the perfect Azeroth, right? So it's Azeroth without any corruption. It's a blueprint. Now, based on some speculation and some hints within the lore, upon reorigination, the blueprint that would be used to reoriginate Azeroth would be the dream. So they would literally use the dream as the blueprint in order to recreate Azeroth. This is sort of, this gives credence to why the old gods. In, uh, sort of invaded the dream and created the Emerald Nightmare because it means that upon reorigination, the Void Essence would also be recreated on Azeroth because it is now part of this perfect vis version of Azeroth, shall we say? So it kind of makes sense in that regard. But then you also look at what the dream has and the things that transpire within the dream. And I can't help but think that everything we know about the dream is completely a lie. I, I think, I, I don't think, I think the dream was here long before Elune or Aenar got here. I think the dream wasn't created by the Titans. I think the dream is literally Azeroth's dream. It's Azeroth dreaming life. Uh, it's where all life comes from. I believe it was the Titans that interfered with that life.
uh, the Titans interfered with it. They ordered it and sort of uh, boxed it in so that they could basically guide whatever came out of it uh, to the best of their abilities. So that's my belief, but there's no evidence in the lore to fully back that up. Uh, Saving Raven, how you doing? It hinted at the overgrowth in the Barrens. Yeah, you could say that. I mean, but again, there's so many various... We've spoken about this before, Apocalypse. The the amount of contradictions about the dream is fucking nuts. Barrow Dance. He has tons of voice dialogue during this. He's seen grief despite his youth. And he even says you, the Night Elf player, has seen your share. He talks about Nari's capture and how it changed her. There's no evidence for that, Obi-Wan. The only thing we have that suggests that Azeroth is indeed a Titan is the Titans saying that Azeroth is a Titan. Apart from that, there's literally zero evidence. There's a strange sound coming through my headset. It's a bit annoying, but never mind. Which leads into amusing on his people. Nari thinks their mourning defines them and tries to bury it under stoicism and duty as a warden. Lysander's face, though, is literally scarred with burns from Taldrassil, but he says he's not broken. None of them are. He even addresses you directly. He says the Night Elves need each other more than ever, and that you see that, and that's why you answered the summonings and took this quest upon yourself. And so, with the portals closed, it's now time to take on their leader, Lord Helnerath, a Dreadlord, and the rival of the original Dreadlord, who used to be in this Aryan classic, Lord Banehollow, who actually recently showed up in the Warlock quest, which is rather suspicious. Mm -hmm. Maiev, of course, seethes in her classic rage, promising his end. The key, of course, though, is Lysander, who can stop the summoning Helnerath is about to finish. Nari mentions how brave her brother has been and that she need not worry, which is a reversal of before, when she hid that, right? This was her prison. She didn't want him to worry about her, uh, sort of showing that really her overprotection was a yeah. mistake and was, in fact, a projection of her own fear. Arkanaran's line for the last quest is cheesy as hell, but it does go hard. It is time to put my, our, demons to rest. I mean, that is, all, like, you're literally killing a demon. That is levels yeah. of uh, cringe that, that meet, <laughs> I am my scars. And it I, I would, wait, 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 wait. I would say I am my scars wasn't really that cringy. It was fucking epic. The way that Illidan screamed that, I would more put it just in in. I would put it equal to the whole together, uh, all the together bullshit. Like Gokot just said there, that's what I would say it it boils down to in terms of cringe levels. The I am my scars is like fucking iconic. In a way, it also kind of rocks. It's that classic blizzard cheese that, you know, if somebody overheard it, it might be a bit embarrassed, but also you're like, yeah, it's kind of cool though, isn't it? He sort of is a scars. Now, that's the kind of stuff that honestly, yeah, WoW needs. Anyway, the fight is, of course, uh, you know, boring because it's modern WoW and those fights are never interesting. But hey, at least the idea of protecting Lysander while he does his thing is thematic as hell. And if this were a proper scenario instead of a non-instance quest, it could have been a really darn cool moment in gameplay. The all right, so he's basically saying what I've been saying for pretty much all of the quests throughout Dragonflight, but also in Shadowlands. Why aren't these quests scenarios? Why does Blizzard insist that story-heavy storylines must be MMO storylines? Like, you have to do it along with everyone else. It really just destroys the storyline. Because you're in here, right? You're supposed to be moving through this, sometimes sneakily, sometimes very methodically, but all around you, it's literally just people slaughtering everything they fucking see. Dude, it's... it's Next level annoyance. By the way, you still have your cyberpunk tag on instead of just chatting. Don't know. Uh, I'm doing it so that you get your drops. 
if we go to just chatting, you will not be getting drops until we log into the game. So by doing this, you get your drops while we react to some stuff, and then we'll play Cyberpunk a bit later, Obi-Wayne. The sort of thing that maybe would be a solo duty that would slap really hard in that other game that I won't mention. Once you're oh, done, yeah. we are treated to what may be the coolest in-game cinematic we've had in WoW in a while, even if, yes, admittedly, it's not the highest quality. Maiev creates an opening for Lysander who blasts Helnarath, affording Maiev the chance to pop her avatar of vengeance and kill the Dreadlord, complete with a fade to black VFX, some real nice sound effects, and the classic It's Over camera shot. Helnarath's ritual causes the whole place to collapse, so Lysander opens a portal, everyone escapes, himself diving out at the last second. It's a little bit goofy because it's all happening in the WoW engine, but hey, mm -hmm. it's got that cool factor, and that's the kind of thing we want. And this is where I want to take a moment to say that this is the energy that WoW needs. It genuinely brings up some memories of Warlords of Draenor and Legion, where the game was a bit rough around the edges, but also was more willing to have fun with it. Yeah. We got shots like this all the time, moments of squeaky survival, of characters popping cooldowns and murdering enemies, it would be a lot more satisfying and a lot more visceral than the experience we got. Made me happy to see that. Imagine the Tyrande Sylvanas cinematic from the Shadowlands, but it doesn't immediately blue balls you by slamming the handbrake and drifting from a long-awaited showdown between two highly motivated characters you guys into this a self-indulgent lecture about how bad violence is. In World of Warcraft, imagine if Thrall had stopped Grom from killing Manoroth and told him that peace cannot be won with war. You're like, oh, it's a fucking demon, kill it. <laughs> anyway, protecting Lysander and this cutscene are uh, the exact sort of groundwork that WoW should have been laying for a long time to make the questing feel cool again. So overall, that's a big win. And there is narrative criticism, but the fact that they can do this sort of thing is a good sign. Outside then, the Moonwell is purified, and this may well be hinting at a future where the elves actually reclaim lost parts of Hygel. That, to me, would make me excited about the prospect of the Nazaroth revamp expansion. I don't think it. Yeah, okay, so, Saven, I've seen that myself. There's been a lot of it. So, this has been happening since 10.1.5. In the game files, we consistently get these AI NPCs. They're literally called AI NPCs, but they seem to be tied to specific dungeons. And we've been constantly talking about what exactly is this? Like, where does this fall in? I would not mind if we eventually got all dungeons to have an AI version of that dungeon where people can go solo because if you could do that for dungeons and you could do that for raids, you can suddenly have people play through the actual fucking story of World of Warcraft in its entirety, uh, uh, including all patch content, so that by the time people get to max level, they actually know what the fuck is up. Right? They know what the story is all about. It'll happen in 2024, but hey, 2026 will do. Time marches onwards. Anyhow, after that, we get to the sappy conclusion. The face markings traditionally reserved for the female-only watchers is given to Lysander, who turns down the pain-numbing bruiseweed, only to be told the moral of the story, that he proves nothing in uh, choosing to dwell in pain when the world offers ways to move past the pain. Completing the cycle of names, he calls her Warden, but then she corrects him, saying it's Maiev. When you get back, Maiev thanks you and hands you the beautiful armor and the glaives. The glaives the Night Elves have wanted for 19 years and grants yep. you the title of Amishan, which means something along the lines of Honor of the Goddess. Tyrande sends you a cute letter in the post thanking you for your aid, celebrating your new title, and saying that she will personally invite Lysander to join the Sentinels. It's all very literal. It's time for the changing of the Kaldori tradition. Uh, not just like letting a man bear the marking of a protector and becoming a sentinel, but uh, to accept mages into you know, society more, showing that sort of thing in the game narrative, and also to accept that they need to move on through the pain instead of just wallowing in it. And sometimes this is where things can fall apart a little bit. Because I will be honest, that's actually one of the things I don't like. 
I, I don't think men should be part of the Sentinels. That's not how Night Elf society operates. It's never been how Night Elf society operates. The Sentinels are the women in that society. They also happen to be the priests. You know, they, they are, it's how their society operates. I, I don't necessarily think it's wrong to have different societies run different cultures and, and have different preferences for how things work, right? Um, uh, Grofile, that's another thing that I don't specifically like, that male characters can be dark rangers. Because again, dark rangers is a very specific thing, and, it, and they were hand-chosen. It's kind of like a shield maiden, right? So if you, if you think about it, right, in Viking history, shield maidens were the women. Right? And a dark ranger fills that same sort of goal, that same... It's not that the men don't have their own titles and their own things that they do, but in this instance, it, it's a dark ranger, and that's very specific. That's a very specific thing that it, that it that it encompasses, and it helps build out a culture. If you compare that to Warhammer 40k, for example, the Adeptus Sororitas are women. The Adeptus Astartes are men. You cannot get an Adeptus Astartes female, because that's not how it works. The genetics wouldn't work on it. The Sisters of Silence, they are 100% female. I don't think there's anything like male Sisters of Silence, right? It doesn't exist. And again, it just helps form cultural things, right? It, it helps sort of cement certain storylines and it helps you really play out those storylines and it makes it flavorful. It makes it unique. So I'm not, it's not like I'm going to quit the game because they did this, just to be clear. It's not like the biggest issue in the world, but I don't necessarily think that, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, I felt like the Sentinels were just fine being all female. Uh, <laughs> it's just, I'm not saying there aren't male blanks, Grofeld, but the male blanks don't join the Sisters of Silence. Because there's basically zero indication that they've been wallowing in pain at all. Plus, their mother being a druid is kind of a retcon of early druids only being males. Uh, night right. elf mages have widely been accepted since the Chandra Lar rejoining in the Cataclysm, and those face markings have been on player character males and NPCs like Malfurion for years, and male sentinels were already a thing as of Battle for Azeroth. So like, s society, just, just forget that, okay? Um, also, Satyr have all. Yeah, but I mean, you could probably make the argument that WoW's gone woke since Battle for Azeroth, right? Uh, this is just them uh, necessarily writing the story for it. You know, they, they may have made those changes back in Battle for Azeroth, not rubbing it in. I'm not trying to be facetious here. It's more a case of um, giving a lore reason for it to exist. So rather than just doing it, you now explain it from a lore perspective. Um, that That's sort of, I think, a, a better way of putting it. And it's important. If you're going to make small changes, it needs to be explained in the lore. Like, the lore needs to keep up, basically. Almost always been uh, male night elves who turned willingly. Um, you know, wh why are, were all of these uh, satyr actually female sentinels who are forcibly corrupted? Um, so, you know, we're kind of we're chopping some things, we're changing some things. One of the things that people liked about the night elves is they're, like, yeah, highly sort of divided uh, society with those more strict roles where yeah, um, yeah like the women were the kind of like badass sentinels killing shit also doing priestess of the moon shit while uh you know the, the men were kind of doing all the druidism and that made them feel different to other societal setups and uh you know that's the way that it was i think the the point and the reason this this is a problem for me not a big problem, I would say, On in terms of what problems could be considered as. This is like a 2% problem. This is sort of like the my, my steak isn't quite warm enough, but it's still warm, so it's fine. Uh, kind of problem, you know? But the, the thing is, when you have different cultures in a video game, the, the only way to really differentiate those... Uh, cultures is by having those cultures be structured differently right so what one of the historically major differences between 
human society and orc society was that human society very much was a, a sort of top-down king, nobleman, peasant society, whereas orc society was far more survival of the strongest, honor, blood, that sort of thing, right? War is honor. To die in war is honorable. Whereas humans had always a lot more value on life, and so they didn't have the equivalent of things like Makara and, and shit of that nature. So it helped differentiate the story. It helped move the story into this is that culture, this is the, this culture, and you can tell what the differences are. As WoW moves on, we've seen this at first between the factions, as the factions sort of existed. Drilliman, holy shit, thank you so much for the five community subs. Really appreciate that. Hearts in chat, ladies and gentlemen. But as the factions have evolved, they've gotten closer and closer together to the point now where there's really no difference between the factions. And as time goes on, we're also now starting to see all of the different cultures in WoW become sort of the same. And, and that's not true. If you, if you think about all of the cultures that we have in the world, they're not the same. Even if we took cultures like Canadians and Americans, there are cultural differences between people that live in New York State and people that live in California that are rather big, right? And, and rather different. There's cultural differences between people living in New York and fucking Texas, and they're all both American. Uh, and they have cultural differences. They have things that they do that are very, very different, things that are accepted in one that would not be accepted in the other. Uh, for me, it, it really feels like it's becoming bland it's almost like Blizzard is creating this blank slate where everything is the same. So you basically just make a, an aesthetic choice rather than actually making a, a cultural choice or, or making a choice that have some repercussions as a result of it. Everything has now just sort of been blank, uh, like broadly brushed under the same banner, if you will. Ramnax, how you doing, brother? Uh, now, the dangerous precedent uh, for WoW's story kind of rears its ugly head here. This is all emotionally sound. It's the story of this young new maid showing the Night Elves a bright future. Very satisfying in paper, especially when his sister's uh, stoicism is shown as pure cope for trauma. But once you examine it, I think some unfortunate truths come to the surface here. This is exactly the sort of thinking that's been pissing people off about WoW's story really since Legion ended. So okay. let me ask this. Why did those things need to change? What was wrong with the Night Elves? Because there's this inherent implication that there was something very wrong with them and that somehow them opening up their minds, changing everything, improves things. Uh, when it comes to wallowing in pain, that absolutely can be true. But uh, the Night Elf people, through Tyrande's story in uh, Shadowlands, got past this, I thought. WoW's had this insane focus on change recently, on dismantling the things that were, and I think people kind of feel that deeply because slowly Azeroth is having its edges sanded off, right? Yeah. And I think it's this pretty toxic approach to handling a world and- We are absolutely, um, almost blanking World of Warcraft, you know? It's becoming a game where there really, there's nothing that makes the game unique from a story perspective. Everything is sort of becoming uh, just. I want to use the word almost whitewashed, right? But not in the racial sense. More in the sense of we need everything to be the same so that there's no. potentially problematic storylines, if that makes sense. Right? We can't have potentially problematic stories. And this goes back to what I said yesterday. It feels like Blizzard is consistently making decisions to ensure that zero out outrage can occur on Twitter. So in other words, we can't have Night Elf Society set up in such a way that Sentinels can only be female because it may cause outrage on Twitter. We can also not have it where druids are primarily male, because that would cause outrage on Twitter. 
We can't have it to where orcs are primarily very much blood, honor, uh, you know, uh, uh, war, savage, because that could create issues on Twitter. We can't have goblins be greedy little fucking asshats because someone might look at that and, and be racist enough to think, oh shit, that means it's Jewish people? So we can't have that either. We have to basically remove everything that could potentially offend anyone in, uh, in any way, shape, or form. Can you imagine if Warhammer 40k tried to do that, how much would they have to re-fucking write that story just to ensure that no one can be offended? Because I will tell you what, if you really want to start looking at things that could offend people, Warhammer 40k is full of it. <laughs> it's basically everything in Warhammer 40k can offend everyone. <laughs> and, uh, and an IP that says, what was there before wasn't good, so it needs to change. And it has this very unfortunate homogenizing effect where, frankly, all of the different groups in World of Warcraft are feeling just more like humans. Yeah. And like, we're in a fantasy world. Why's everyone got to feel like humans? Humans are the boring race. It's kind of like, yeah, really sorry, are, did, did you really love the Night Elves as you saw them in Warcraft 3? All that content you played, content in uh, in vanilla? Well, you know what? Too bad, actually. They were actually per traumatized victims and all that isolationism and feral adherence to nature. That was pure cope. And instead, they should have basically just acted. See, this boils down to what I genuinely believe. If you listen to a lot of the California woke crowd, they will tell you that there is no such thing as cultural differences. But then they'll also tell you that you have to respect people's cultures, right? Not, of course, uh, Western culture, but all other cultures must be, must be respected. But of course, there is no such thing as actual cultural differences. All cultures are exactly the same. Because these people have no real life experience whatsoever. They, they, they don't go out of their bubble. They are caught inside California. California is the only place that exists as far as they're concerned. And so when they see people from other cultures in California, they just imagine that the Mexican guy sitting next to them that went to the same school that they did, that went to the same university that they did, that believes and acts exactly the same as they do, this is what all Mexicans are like, right? Or this is what all... African people are like, I will tell you what, Rage Darling, how are you doing? Thanks for the raid. Really appreciate that. How are you? Um, it really feels like we're losing a lot of the identity of what I guess you would call the different races of World of Warcraft are, are about. Right? It feels like all of the, the orcs, for example, now What's the difference between the orcs and the humans? Actually, let's go even larger. Let's not even talk about the individual races of WoW. Let's just ask, what's the difference between the Horde and the Alliance? Okay, anyone can fucking take it. What is the difference between the Horde and the Alliance? It's a simple question. What's the difference, Ramnax? What makes them different? Because I can't tell you, right? I, I can't tell you what the difference is. Well, no, there's gameplay differences. I'm talking about the, the ideological difference between the Horde and the Alliance. So back in the day, the reason the Horde and the Alliance went to war with one another was because the Horde, very much honor-based, very much um, savage, right? These were savage racists. They were very much marred in their blood and honor and really the orcs shaped that society in many ways okay um because the orcs were the ones who founded uh, really the horde and all of the other races sort of joined in to the horde so the the orc model was what shaped many of the others misunderstood savages could probably be a, a, a good way of putting it astralumi how you doing thanks for uh, the first time chat really appreciate that has always been uh, what keeps them together uh, it, that's true. But nowadays, if you look at the difference between the Horde and the Alliance, they're the same. Ideologically speaking, there is no difference. 
since the war chief has been completely dismantled, there's not even that really that you could point to the horde and say, well, that's what makes them different. They have a war chief and the alliance have a king. The alliance kind of have a council style system, even though Anduin is technically the king, the way alliance structures work, the king uh, doesn't make all of the decisions for the alliance. He sort of has a council of people that, inform that informs him of what needs to happen. And that's now the same for the horde as well. A lot of the differences have disappeared uh, over the course of the last, I would say, six, seven years for World of Warcraft. And it's a little annoying because those were the things that I loved about WoW. You know, I liked playing an orc because, yeah, we were fucking savage, bro. <laughs> Makura, if we had a disagreement, let me kill you. <laughs> you know, there, there, there was no... Uh, we'll take you to court or we'll call the guards. No, no. Fuck you, bro. You you, you disrespected me. Deal to the death. And that was just it. You know, that, that was just the game we played. Uh, it, it just, it feels like a lot of that magic is being slowly but surely eroded. And World of Warcraft is more just becoming a blank slate where, you know, pick and choose your poison because it's really mainly just aesthetic. Like those good, nice, kind humans like that Anduin Rin, who's a good boy, whose hair is so very blonde and perfect, uh, you know, and just act like every other group in the game. It's kind of devoid of tooth and claw, and I think it kind of pisses over the actual uh, race's uh, story and their history. Mm -hmm. It just very quickly takes them from where they've been in the game to clearly Blizzard just being like, yeah, make them humans like Anduin. <laughs> and, like, there was good things. It had a Maya action scene, but the rest was kind of her just giving in to some kid who thinks he knows better than she does. And is that really how you treat a legendary hero in the Warcraft franchise? I'm not saying Maiev uh, should be flawless. In fact, if Ilden is his scars, then she is her flaws. And that's actually perfectly okay. And a character being able to move past their flaws, yes, that, that's good. That can happen. But it's going too far, too fast. It needs mm -hmm. more time to cook, right? This is a story that shouldn't happen in a 20 minute quest. And it therefore comes off as having very little respect for the Maiev that people loved in Warcraft 3 and later in the Burning Crusade. Night Elves have nothing to apologize for. They have no weaknesses to overcome from perhaps their own perspective because at their- It depends. Uh... Cecius, whether Panda and the crowd would actually take offense to it. Because if you break down World of Warcraft's story from the start, it is a story of incredible xenophobia and racism. I know that might be uncomfortable for people to hear, but always remember it's a fantasy universe. None of the characters in this game are actually real, nor do they represent any real race in the world. But it is a story of incredible xenophobia and racism. It's what's always fueled the game. Uh, we dislike pretty much everyone that isn't us, and we like only the people that is us. If you specifically want to really start breaking it down, you will find that even within the Horde, uh, they they were only ever friends because it was necessary to be friends. It wasn't like they were really, truly allies. There were always factions within the Orcs that believed that they were the superior race of the Horde. Garrosh was one of these faction leaders. There were always factions within the trolls, within the, the Tauren may actually be the one different, uh, the one difference, because the Tauren actually historically have always had a decent relationship with even the Night Elves, because both of them care mostly about nature. So they, they get very, very offended if you destroy nature, but, you know, they, they don't really have that same share of hate for any of the other uh, races as much. But in terms of like the vast majority of story, humans have all have historically been incredibly racist, even towards dwarves and gnomes and, and all the rest of them. 
uh, it wasn't until much later that that those relationships sort of got mended uh, purely again out of necessity, and then they actually did become super good friends. But it was necessity first that drove that uh, in some ways, and even there, they're still not like the same, right? There, there's still very big differences between the two of them. They just happen to need each other, and also they've become so intertwined with one another that it would be completely impossible to dismantle that. And that's definitely being written out of WoW. Like that, that is certainly being written out of WoW. At least that's how it feels at the moment. Uh, maybe, maybe Blizzard is cooking something incredibly different, and maybe what Blizzard is cooking is actually really good. But um, the character you play as, uh, the Baconator, what do you mean? <laughs> We're proud enough people, and uh, both times they had major failings, with, uh, you know, the Empire causing the War of the Ancients, and Illidan's illicit well of eternity, they rose to the occasion and they did what they had to do. In fact, their crazy closeness to nature and their reverence for Elun is where their identity and their strength came from. So, making a super big deal about accepting a mage and dismantling their the sort of way their society is stratified. That comes across as change for the sake of change. And sure, you can read this as them letting go of their traumas and moving on, but that treats their history as PTSD to overcome rather than the choices that made them who they are. Even if it's actually executed fine, I think the ideas behind this story are direct antithesis of what people actually want and expect have, for the seven. Night Elves. So, I would say, enough of the therapy, honestly, we need a little bit of action. We don't need an 18-year-old prodigy showing up with a better understanding of the Fell than the 10,000-plus-year-old Warden making zero mistakes, proving everyone wrong, and saving the day. Because this just reeks of insecurity. The insecurity of staff inheriting the franchise, now stuck with a bunch of fantasy races that they don't particularly like the way that they are. This change it mm -hmm. attitude is what led to Shadowlands feeling the way that it did, and it kind of hurts me to say that, because this quest has got attention to detail from Classic, and the Night Elves are is clearly a labor of love, except for some strange narrative insecurities. It's just completely thematically misplaced. I would argue, Saven, that the relationship specifically between the Orcs and the Forsaken is probably the best explanation for how the relationship between most Horde races have always been. Most, not all. There are some exceptions. But very much so. The only reason the Orcs actually accepted the, uh, the Forsaken into their ranks was out of necessity. Thrall hated the Forsaken. In fact, Thrall originally wanted to go and kill the Forsaken. But they needed more soldiers because they would have lost, they, they needed allies against the Alliance. And so they made the deal. I believe it was Kern that convinced Thr Thrall to accept the Forsaken into the, into the Horde. I think it was Kern. I may, I may actually be mistaken about this, but I think it was Kern. Um, uh, and it was purely out of necessity. It, it was not because, you know, Thrall thought, fuck, Sylvanas is a nice booty. That is not why, uh, you know, that's why I would have accepted the Forsaken into the Horde, but that is not why Thrall did it. Thrall was not swayed at all by Sylvanas' hips or booty. Not even a little bit. So d don't for a second think that they were friends with one another. Although that is probably going to change as time goes on now. Uh, this is the attitude, whether intentional or not, that leaves people with a Netflix witch or, or a cowboy bebop, I suppose, instead of what, a Netflix One Piece, with a Shadowlands instead of a Legion. It's also, unfortunately, quite boring. A quick escort quest into a Barrow Den, and then a fight that's over in a few seconds. Come on. That other MMO does story duties that have people clenching all over the place. Here is an alternative. It's the same thing, but instead of Lysander being this perfect zoomer, he actually makes mistakes. 
he's new. So he gets enraptured by the raw, corruptive power of the Fell because of something Halnarath does, even though he's very well-meaning. Perhaps being young, he lacks the wisdom that Maiev and the rest have, because while Maiev is a traumatized, damaged person from the crazy time she has had on uh, Azeroth, uh, she's also very experienced and very wise. And she's sort of, she's not generically wise, she's, you know, in her own little domain. But that should still shine through. Mm -hmm. And perhaps through the guidance of some of these older characters, he is able to pass his test, pass his rookie mission, you know, break the temptation, break free. I suppose you could do some sort of appeal to a loon to intervie intervene or something, which would be a bit cliche, and I don't think we should really do that. But something that actually has him grow more in... I think the problem, Saven, that Palular is trying to highlight here, although I'm not entirely sure if this is his based video yet, uh, he's usually much better at sort of highlighting what the problem is, but I think the problem here specifically that he's trying to highlight is you have a character here that in terms of just life experience and wisdom knows far more than this little mage will ever know. And yet this mage appears to be the one that, that is far more, wis uh, far more wise and far more um, weathered in the approach, w which kind of disrespects Maiev's age and her wisdom. And I think that's the point that Balera is trying to make. Is it? It almost feels disrespectful to Maiev's character, considering everything that Maiev have done uh, in World of Warcraft history. In terms of struggles that he must overcome, instead of just continually being right about everything and saying, "Hey, we've got to heal, man," it just feels boring. And perhaps for the other characters, maybe Maiev is a bit touchy, right? A bit worried about this whole magic thing, because magic has some real, real historical baggage for, uh, for their civilization, you know? They could have used this to more genuinely bridge the gap between the generations, instead of it feeling like the new replacing the obsolete, you know? Last year's model, built for a different task, no longer particularly needed. And a change to this that would respect their history more, treat these things with reverence, but still allow those characters to grow and to, yes, start to slowly push up against the barriers of what has defined their civilization. You can do all of these things, but you need to give them time, and you need to do them deftly, not just... Bam! Good Zoomer boy, there you go. Done. Because ultimately, cool. the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and what has happened when Night Elf fans have seen this piece of content? They've, they've not been happy. It's the Heritage Quest. It should be, you know, so, celebrating the Heritage Quest. So, right, Fox, the lore in this regard would actually disagree with you, because Sylvanas is one of only three Forsaken we know of that does not rot and is not rotting. It is Sylvanas, it is Nathanos, and it is Kalia Menethil. These are the only three known Forsaken that aren't rotting from the inside, and that is because they both, they all three of them underwent a ritual. Well, Kalia Menethil had the light do some weird fucking bullshit that we still don't quite understand how the light even had the ability to do that. But both Sylvanas and Nathanos underwent a ritual that halted th that process. Right? So in other words, their corpses are completely preserved. So for example, we know from Shadows Rising that uh, Nathanos smells of nothing. Uh, uh, in fact, Nathanos uses uh, a mask in order to give himself a saint. Because what he has found is most people find it very unsettling to stand next to someone that literally smells of nothing. Because his body has no odor. 
So he doesn't smell of, of rot. He he doesn't have a smell because his his body is basically preserved in a moment of in time for all eternity. So that would be a lore thing. You know, Hannah Thanos ate his cousin's body in the ritual. Who was the other person in Savannah's ritual? It's odd. We don't see her nephews, no? Um, Alpocalypse. That's a conversation that I think the, the Discord has had multiple times as well. It, it, exactly. Uh, we know who Thanos had to consume in order to basically preserve himself forever. We've never heard like, or learned what Sylvanas had to do. She had to have done something because the ritual is the same. There's no way of skipping that. But they've never even given a thought to that. I wonder if they even have a clue as to who Sylvanas consumed. ...heritage of their people. Instead, it's a preachy lecture about trauma from a kid instead of a celebration of what it means to be a hero of the Night Elves. It was also limited in scope. Just talking about some elves, because 10.2's PTR... Oh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty big ritual, so what you, would, what you need to do, and this is where the ritual... You need someone of your own blood lineage, right? So someone from your bloodline, you need to consume them. And that's how you are preserved. So technically speaking, all Forsaken can do it, but they would need to find someone of their bloodline that is still alive in order to consume them. Welcome to the rice field. Uh, Pizza Hut, how you doing, bro? Thanks for the two gifted subs, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But I don't know how many people would be willing to do that, right? So you're going to have to figure out you're going to have to find the living, and then also you're going to have to find Forsaken that are willing to consume their own family members in order to become preserved. So technically speaking, yes, everyone can go through the ritual if they have living family members. Our story actually does a great job of introducing Night Elf. Where's the hearts in chat? I see gifted subs. I see no hearts in chat. You guys are bastards, you know that? So... F wow. That's not cordial at all, chat. It's not cordial at all. I was traumatized by Taldrassil and seeing the various different ways that their people cope, for better and for worse. It handles this stuff vastly better than this quest. The Druids of the Flame and 10.2 uh, being a dream patch is the love I don't the care, Seven. needed, and it leaves the heritage shall leave hearts. in an awkward place where it accomplished basically nothing except finally giving us some banging armor and the glaives. But I suppose the Moonwell's happenings pave the way for the reclamation of their forests. Mm -hmm. With that being said, though, my final point. I really hope the interviews are uh, wrong or are teasing or are misinterpreted regarding Malfurion. Because just like how Legion managed to involve Tyrande, Malfurion, and Illidan, yet not even have those characters talked with each other, the idea that we finally go to the Emerald Dream, and Malfurion, one of the characters the most associated with it, is not involved is preposterous. And the developers may say, yes, well, you know, he's got to hold down the fort in Ardenweald. No one gives a fuck about Ardenweald. <laughs> Ardenweald is wrapped up true. in the worst thing. Fucking true. No one gives a fuck about Ardenweald. No one gives a fuck about Shadowlands, bro. If Blizzard came out tomorrow, and, and this, I guarantee you, if Blizzard came out tomorrow and said that the Shadowlands was nothing but a fever dream induced by Nazoth, people would actually fucking celebrate that. Like, people would actually celebrate the fact that that entire expansion can, expansion can now be forgotten for all eternity. We don't even have to think that that fucking even happened. Uh, so, it, it is true. I am actually currently working on a video where I ask a very fucking simple question. Why the fuck did we exchange Ysera for Malfurion? Like, what even was the point of that exchange? We need to bring Ysera back, all right? Okay, cool. We need to get Ysera back because we need to get all the aspects on fucking point. We need this. Okay, so we go into Ardenweald and we bring Ysera back. But in order to do this, we lose Malfurion for some 
unexplained reason, but Malfuria needs to stay there because the Winter Queen, I don't know, needs a dick or some shit. I don't know. Maybe her vibrator broke and Malfurion can do something with his penis. I don't know exactly, but I know he has to stay. All right. Now, now Ysera comes back. First thing Ysera fucking does is she goes, oh, by the way, thanks for bringing me back, but I can no longer be the aspect. All right, motherfucker, then why are you here? Why did we just leave Malfurion there? If you could have literally fucking stayed there and your daughter was already here, we could have just made her the aspect then. What are you doing here? And since then, she's just been sitting in front of the fucking portal, chilling. They literally just chilling like a villain, doing absolutely fucking nothing. And it's like, okay, so we lost Malfurion. You didn't become the aspect for some weird reason. Your daughter is now the aspect, which could have happened even without you out of the fucking Ardenweald place. Now Malfurion is in Ardenweald. And we still don't quite know what the fuck you're doing, except for the fact that you're now somehow tied to a loon, but also tied to death for some reason. I It is quite literally one of the most perplexing storylines ever. Especially the fact that nothing yet happened with her. Uh, it, it, even if Blizzard does something with it now, it still feels a little criminal that it didn't happen sooner. Something must have happened already expansion you ever did and storylines that were absolute wet squibs and it's you know it's even funny shadowlands was a stupidly preachy expansion at times with yep just forced characters that were so poorly written yep. like pelagos who funny enough voices lysander <laughs> so again pelagos that story could have been great you know where he started where he ended both good how you got there, where was the meat? <laughs> I don't know what's up with all this constant therapy talk, uh, a lack of action, the amount of tell don't show. There's bits of this quest that actually do show don't tell, you know, finally, right? And that's what I talk about that's cool, uh, you know, in this video. But this still shows that they are very inconsistent with their narrative because on the other hand, you look at the Forsaken. Ha! <laughs> Death to the Living, the Forsaken quest line, it's fucking awesome. They are the Forsaken, right? They're, you know, using the way that they can breathe underwater, leaping out of the water, killing motherfuckers, absolute brutality, and it's great. It's just what the Forsaken should be. Yeah. Why did they get to be the Forsaken, but the Night Elves don't get to be Night Elves? It's just like how Bane Bloodoof has turned into a bovine Anduin. Come on. Have some actual diversity in your characters, please. All this stuff feels the goddamn same. And with that, I'll see you next time. Simple question. I, I will ask it in a different way. Tell me why Bane should be in the Horde and not be in the Alliance. And you're not allowed to say because he's Torin. You can't. There's no fucking argument that you can make that will ever convince me that Bane belongs with the Horde. He seems to have far more in common with the Alliance, even with the Horde not really being that different to the Alliance. It, it, it just, it, it's, it feels... <sighs> I think Balila said it best here. It feels like we're being preached to quite often with World of Warcraft's quest design. This is my same problem I have with most Hollywood movies. This is my same problem I have with a lot of games these days. It feels like I'm being preached to. I'm not just able to play a game. And this is where we sort of get to the... Whenever we say, leave your politics out of my video games, we're not saying that video games can't have politics. We're saying your video game should not fucking preach to me what your politics are. I should not be able to play this fucking game and then immediately know who the fuck you voted for. If that happens, we have a problem. Um, and it doesn't matter who the fuck you vote for. If I'm playing your video game and I go, okay, this guy seriously voted Rep Republican, you failed. If I go, okay, this guy definitely voted Democrat, you failed.
I should not be able to know that just off of the fucking game you made. Unless, of course, your game is called uh, Only Republicans Get to Play or some shit like that, right? Or For the Right or whatever. If that's your game, cool. Okay, I know when I buy this game, I'm going to be playing some Republican game. I'm probably going to be playing Mitch McConnell, right? And and one of his drawbacks is he, he gets a stroke every five minutes or some shit. I don't know, right? But then at least I know, right, this is the shit that's going to happen here. Or to the left, and I'm going to play as Nancy Pelosi. And one of my superpowers is I have a very expensive fridge that shits ice cream or some shit. I don't fucking know, right? But at least then I know exactly what I'm playing. If your game isn't called that, I shouldn't know who the fuck you voted for because it should not be important.